For decades, the American Mafia ruled the criminal underworld of the United States and beyond. Organized crime was an all-American business, owned and operated by powerful families, outfits, and figureheads with their own rules and their own laws. They were untouchable and nearly invincible. The Mafia was so well-established and so knit into the fabric of urban societies that no law enforcement agency was able to make a crack in their criminal activities. Their influence even reached into the heights of society. They paid off judges, police officers, politicians, and controlled entire industries. It was very frustrating, but, you know, there was always tainted officers that were willing to uh, accept monies uh, from the mob uh, as a way of supplementing their income. They got perks out on the strip. They got uh, jackets, gold bracelets, uh, necklaces and rings and things like that to look the other way or uh, not look at all. For decades, law enforcement lacked the resources, skills, tools, or the will to go after the mob. But there were some young hotheads who came along and decided to take a stand. They drafted new laws, targeted influential mobsters, used new technology to gather intelligence, and found trusted informants. Some even infiltrated families deep undercover. I'm glad. Joseph Pistone uh, was an FBI agent, uh, 27 years, and using the name Donnie Brasco, I was able to infiltrate the uh, Bonanno uh, crime family in New York City. And finally, the long arm of the law could reach the American Mafia. This is Mafia, the Crackdown. As the director of the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover fought crime for nearly 50 years, but through the 1930s and 1940s, he vehemently denied that there was any organized crime in America. Former NYPD detective Joe Coffey. They had their hand in everything because nobody would look at them. Nobody would even consider investigating them, not the least of which was J. Edgar Hoover. He refused to admit there was a mafia. The only law enforcement agency in this country that was investigating the mob in the 50s and 60s, early 60s, was the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. They were the only ones who really exposed what organized crime was doing. But they were getting nowhere because the feds wouldn't back them up. The feds ignored organized crime. Former mafia investigator Ronald Goldstock. The FBI, and Hoover in particular, tended to deny the existence of the mob. And that was for different reasons. No one really knows the answer. Um, but one possibility is he recognized the corruption potential um, that the mob had uh, when they engaged in vice activities, things that the public wanted um, in terms of goods and services. Hoover's denial of the mafia only fit to serve them. And for several decades, they could get away with nearly anything. On November 14th, 1957, a summit was called in Appalachian, New York. The top crime bosses from around the United States all of a sudden were gathered in one place. Crime author Thomas Repetto. All, all we know that a bunch of gangsters, top gangsters from the United States and elsewhere, suddenly appeared in Appalachian, New York, in, in a, a very remote part of the state of New York. And you can no longer deny that there was some kind of national syndicate. Why was a guy from 2,000 miles away wandering? They all said the same thing. We went to see the uh, Joe, who was the local guy, because we heard he was sick. And we all, they all showed up at the same time. The local and state law enforcement couldn't ignore the very public gathering, and they broke the meeting up. But the FBI and Hoover were stubborn. But basically, the FBI did, did very little. Ronald Goldstock. The, the, on, on the federal level, the only um, agency that was interested in all in organized crime tended to be um, uh, the Bureau of Narcotics. And that's because there was an alliance between Sicilian Mafia and American Cosa Nostra in dealing drugs at that time. 
The failure of the raid only proved that the FBI could not be trusted yet with taking down the mob. And so the early successes the law enforcement had were mostly thanks to determined individuals who took it upon themselves to go after some of the country's biggest mobsters. In the 1930s and 40s, New York prosecutor and district attorney Thomas Dewey was relentless in his pursuit of the mafia. This earned him the nickname Gangbuster. He targeted organized crime like no one had done before him and went after the big players like Dutch Schultz and Lucky Luciano. Crime author Nate Henley. Thomas Dewey is almost the exact opposite of Dutch Schultz. Other than the fact that they were born in the same year, they have almost nothing in common. He's almost a stereotypical straight arrow. You know, great student at school, you know, great marks, becomes a, a prosecutor, you know, he's got a uh, passion for the law, passion against crime, and he's very serious and he's very incorruptible. Uh, so he really sort of does not like gangsters at all and is one of their most ferocious enemies. Uh, he has a mustache, you know, he's very clean cut looking, and he carries himself with certain dignity and he uh, is, as I said, absolutely incorruptible and very, very serious about putting these guys behind bars. One of the distinguishing factors is that he can't be bribed, he has a visceral dislike of organized crime, and he really sort of sets his sight on getting gangsters like Dutch Schultz behind bars. He also targeted Lucky Luciano at a different point. Dewey rose through the ranks when he was appointed special attorney to investigate gambling rackets. Dewey first set his sights on prosecuting Dutch Schultz, who was big in the bootlegging and numbers rackets. He successfully took Schultz to trial twice on tax evasion and made himself a mortal enemy. Well, Schultz is initially delighted to hear this report from Albert Anastasia saying, well, here's a way we could actually kill Thomas Dewey. He's thinking, great, you know, we can get this guy off my back. Schultz failed to get a contract on Dewey. Meanwhile, Dewey also targeted Mafia leader and head of the mob commission, Lucky Luciano. Luciano was convicted on a prostitution racket. Crime author Ernest Volkman. He gathered together auditors, bookkeepers, experts, investigators in a task force. And he targeted some of the major uh, gangsters. He achieved the conviction of Luciano, which was incredible. I mean, this was the Lord High master criminal, and somehow he went down. With the momentum of prosecuting Luciano, Dewey went on to break up the poultry racket of gangster Tootsie Herbert and made dozens more raids over his career. Dewey was a very extraordinary man. He had a legal mind like nobody had ever seen. Dewey was the kind of guy, he would sit there and somebody would relate to him a, a prosecution case. He would listen quietly and then repeat it word for word and then turn around and argue with equal brilliance the defense case against it. That's how good he was. And what he did was for the first time begin to organize uh, anti-crime in the way that crime had been organized. I'm really excited to tell you about the sponsor for today's show. It's a fantastic new novel by New York Times best-selling author Andrew Gross. Get this description. Button Man brings to life the birth of organized crime in 1930s New York City through the story of one family. Now you know why I'm excited. You're going to love this book. Button Man is part historical thriller, part family saga. You've got great descriptions of immigrant life in New York's Lower East Side in the 20s and 30s. And the family part is partly based on Gross's own family, which is pretty cool. And then he weaves in real history. It's got appearances by mobsters Louis Lepke Bukalter, Dutch Schultz, and also special prosecutor Thomas Dewey. If you've been listening to this show, you already know all of these guys. Here's what best-selling author Linda Fairstein says about it. Button Man is a riveting piece of historical fiction, exposing the Jewish mob of the 1930s who preyed on the garment industry and the brave few who stood up against them. This book is a heartstopper. 
And number one New York Times bestselling author Kristen Hanna calls Button Man a compelling, fast-paced historical thriller. Fans of Boardwalk Empire and Dennis Lehane will love it. Forget Dennis Lehane. Fans of Mafia will love it. Button Man by Andrew Gross is available now in hardcover, ebook, and audio. From Minotaur Books. Go to the audio version if you can. It's really good. Button Man by Andrew Gross. While Dewey was able to prosecute many gangsters for tax evasion and embezzlement, there was no law that could charge them with murder, racketeering, extortion, and the like. Most mafia bosses wouldn't get their hands dirty. They just gave the orders. Therefore, they were virtually immune from prosecution. Prosecutors needed a more effective weapon, a new law to go after them, and the answer was RICO. Former NYPD detective Joe Coffey. RICO, the RICO statute enacted by the Body Congress in the early 70s, stands for Racketeer Influence Corrupt Organization. The weapon that was developed by Ron Goldstock and Bob Blakey, who wrote, actually wrote the statute, was put in place for us in law enforcement to be able to better control organized crime and investigate. And it became a magnificent weapon. And it really, really caused the downfall of organized crime as we knew it in those days and as we knew it today. RICO was the biggest weapon we ever got. And we got it from Congress, so thanks to Goldstock and Blakey. Former Mafia investigator Ronald Goldstock helped draft the RICO laws, which came into effect in 1970. He put into context how the tools of investigation and prosecution changed and became more effective over time. And I think to understand what was happening with organized crime and law enforcement at the time, you need to look at both law enforcement and, and the mob. Uh, the mob began in the 30s. Um, as you move on from the 30s to the 40s to the 50s to the 60s, there are generational changes. And they've, the people that then joined the mob view up, um, came in with the values of their contemporaries. And they were more concerned about what they were going to get rather than what was happening within the mob. Um, law enforcement, on the other hand, for a long time denied its existence. Um, by the 1950s, the FBI got interested. And that meant, um, not in terms of prosecution, but in terms of finding out what was going on, what they had missed all this time. And so they began a program of uh, wiretapping um, and um, trying to determine um, who occupied various positions and how the organization was structured. Um, Bobby Kennedy comes in in 1960 as the attorney general for John Kennedy. Uh, and reinvigorates the organized crime and racketeering section. Former NYPD detective Joe Coffey. When Robert Kennedy became the attorney general, he's the one who put the fire under the ass of the FBI to start investigating the mob. Robert Kennedy, brother of John F. Kennedy, had been appointed as the U.S. attorney general in 1961 and doubled down on pursuing organized crime. Earlier in his career, he served as chief counsel during the Teamsters Union corruption trials. The trials set to prosecute Union Representative Jimmy Hoffa, which led to some standoffs with the Mafia. Journalist John Siegenthaler. And to see the two of them, Jimmy Hoffa and Robert Kennedy, engage in that, those three sessions before that committee, uh, I mean, it was like theater. It was drama. Uh, it was gripping, and, um, and, uh, and it was a struggle. You came away with it with a clean idea uh, that Hoffa and the Union were linked to organized crime and the mob. Bobby Kennedy came in knowing about a particular crime problem that only the federal government could do something about. And he brings in some of the best and brightest prosecutors at that point, including uh, G. Robert Blakey. Um, Blakey now sees what is lacking in federal enforcement. He understands that there aren't the correct tools, um, that the behind the times. Professor Robert Blakey drafted the RICO Act. RICO is really three different things. 
it changes the way you investigate crimes. Instead of investigating criminals, you investigate criminal organizations. It's also a theory of trial. Instead of trying individuals individually, you try them as part of the group. And, and therefore the trial is larger and it's fuller. The jury gets to hear more evidence what actually happened. Uh, and it's a theory of sanction, which is to say the kind of sentences that come out of it are incapacitatory. They're 40, 50 years. And the property that was used in the course of the commission of the crime or gained in it uh, are forfeited to the government. And the impact of taking out individuals basically off the street and seizing the assets involved uh, is very powerful. It, it's changed the rules of the game. And the RICO statute, of course, was so sophisticated that no one understood it for another 10, 15 years. And the RICO statute allowed groups of people to be prosecuted for um, multiple conspiracies. So it made it under 19, 18 U.S.C. 1962 C a crime to conduct the affairs of an enterprise, which could be a mob family, through a pattern of racketeering activity, which meant that it was more difficult to prove because you had to prove the existence of the organization, but it allowed you for the first time to prove the existence of the organization. The RICO Act was a game changer for law enforcement. If law enforcement could prove any two, quote, acts of racketeering, it proved a criminal pattern and a criminal organization. And these acts included such common mafia activities as bribery, extortion, drug dealing, and murder. Well, like any mafia boss, any old school mafia boss, they didn't believe in, in going on television and publicizing themselves. Uh, you know, they, they tried to keep a low profile and naturally to keep themselves removed through several levels from what happened in, at the operating level. That's where the RICO law was so destructive to the mob because you could now get people who didn't actually go out and pull the trigger. With the RICO Act as a tool, Blakey and the rest of the law enforcement agencies focused on figuring out ways to catch the mobsters in the act. Any act. By 1970, he now starts dealing with all of the other legislation that's needed to deal with this crime problem. And so he does uh, dangerous, uh, dangerous special offender sentencing. Um, he does witness protection. He does use immunity, uh, allowing people to testify uh, where only what they say can't be used against them. All of a sudden, the FBI, with its uh, wiretap authority, um, and with its informants and with the RICO statute started moving heavily into this area. And along with the new modern laws came new modern equipment and a new breed of highly trained agents. The FBI was now using surreptitious surveillance techniques to eavesdrop on mobsters' conversations to gather incriminating evidence. Former FBI Special Agent Jim Wagner an expert on electronic surveillance, worked on Operation Pendorf, the wiretapping of Alan Dorfman's personal phone lines. Wagner explains some of the ins and outs of a major wiretapping operation. The process to bug a room or to place a microphone in a room requires the court to provide authority for the FBI or any other law enforcement agency who has the right to do that, um, to surreptitiously enter the premises and to place a microphone where it will not be easily discovered. To do a entry to place a microphone uh, is a time-consuming effort that is not done um, in one night. It's usually something that takes a lot of preparation a lot of time planning, and it takes a lot of people so that you're not discovered. You will always use other surveillance people to watch the area. If you are aware of, let's say it's a 
single location and you're aware of who has a key to get into that location, you will surveil that person and make sure he doesn't come back to that location while you're there. Because if he leaves to come in in the middle of the night, you have to tell the people to get out of there. That type of monitoring takes a lot of patience and a lot of uh, people just don't have that kind of patience. Wiretapping turned out to be one of the most effective ways of bringing down even the most untouchable mob boss. With these tools, along with the RICO Act, law enforcement was able to put some of the big names behind bars. Sam Giancana, John Gotti, Dutch Schultz. Entire families and outfits were taken out of commission. Chicago Strike Force leader Doug Roller. The best evidence you can use in court is the defendant's own words. You cannot undo your words. You might try to explain them away, but if there are enough words there, you're sunk. To best get those words straight from the horse's mouth, the FBI sometimes relied on an old-fashioned method, undercover work. In the 1980s, the most famous undercover agent, Joe Pistone, took his place in the mob as the gangster Donnie Brasco. Uh, Joe Pistone, uh, a fantastic FBI agent, uh, a real hero, and should be seen as a hero by the American public. Someone who actually put his life on hold uh, to really get to the, the root of uh, a segment of organized crime in the United States, and put his life on, on the line, really. Pistone spent the better part of a decade rising up among the ranks of the Bonanno family. The operation got countless mafiosos killed and eventually led to the arrest of all five family capos. The case came to a head in what was known as the Commission Trial. Former FBI agent Pat Colgan. Well, needless to say, the convictions of many of the Bonanno family members, including Joe Messina, was very satisfying to uh, many law enforcement people who, who uh, were involved in the investigations. But by no means did law enforcement think we had eradicated the entire crime problem. That, that was never the case. But it did have a, a detrimental effect on the organized crime family. Uh, the impact it had on, on the way the FBI dealt with the mafia was that we showed they weren't invincible. And uh, we brought out and, and, and showed a lot of the illegal activities that they were involved in that we could uh, charge them with uh, and, and, and basically that we can go after and get the upper echelon versus, you know, versus the guys on the bottom doing all the dirty work. Uh, and, you know, they saw that and uh, they, they started to... Uh, to emphasize, you know, using the RICO to get these guys. It took the U.S. several decades to finally crack down on organized crime in America. There are always going to be new threats and other organized crime groups, but the power and influence the American mafia once held over American society was so unprecedented, and it is unlikely to make a comeback. But law enforcement is prepared for what the future might hold. Today, as a result of the FBI, wiretapping, the Witness Protection Program, and RICO, there are no families in the United States outside of the city of New York. And New York, of the, that had five families, now has at best two and a half and they're not the significant th thing that they were in corrupting unions and the police uh, uh, that they were in 1963. The sun has not set on the mob, but it's clearly twilight. And a major factor in that is legislation passed by... In the next bonus episode... The Mafia had ruled the underground for a long time, but they never would have gone so far without the help of some very corrupt officials. Frank Costello was the Prime Minister of New York Organized Crime uh, back in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. 
Actually, Frank ended up in control of Tammany Hall, which was for 100 years the leading political organization in New York City. How the Mafia infiltrated the unions, politicians, and even the CIA, and what they expected in return. Organized crime has tentacles into legitimate business. They, um, they're in business to be in business. So, it's, uh, so they need to reach in and have uh, tentacles into the police department, in maybe the state prosecutor's office, uh, the attorney general's office, the Department of Insurance. And uh, they need to have those persons in case they need a favor. Next week, Mafia Bonus 3, The Establishment. This has been an Audio Boom and World Media Rights co-production, hosted by me, Fleet Cooper. It is produced by Audio Boom's Ben Hosley and Rachel Jacobs and Bettina Vasquez for World Media Rights. We had editing help from David Markowitz, with additional production from World Media Rights by Gerald Zabingua. David McNabb is the series' creative director, and the executive producers for Audio Boom are Brendan Reagan and Stuart Last. Thanks to St. Martin's Press for sponsoring this episode. Follow Mafia on Spotify or subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you find your favorite shows. And if you've got some time, give us a review. Hey, Mafia fans, here's a secret I just can't stay silent about. We have officially launched a merch store, and it's live on Audioboom right now. If you love Mafia and want to show your support, head over to audioboom.com forward slash merch forward slash Mafia. You can buy a nice mug, a phone case that the FBI hasn't tapped, or a journal to keep a list of people you can trust. Or maybe those you can't. You'll be as stylish as Lucky Luciano. Be sure to keep an eye on the store as new designs and products get added regularly. That's audioboom.com forward slash merch forward slash mafia. Thanks for your support. <laughs>